everybody, and welcome to another edition of This Week in Hearing. I'm Brian Taylor, and the topic this week is regenerative medicine and audiology. Uh, and at the forefront of this effort to regrow human cochlear hair cells is a company some of you may be a little bit familiar with in the, uh, in the press, so that's uh, Frequency Therapeutics. And with us today are two executives from Frequency Therapeutics, Carl LaBelle and uh, Kevin Frank. I want to welcome you both to the broadcast, and I thought a good place to start before we dive in would be for both of you to uh, introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about your background. Um, again, I'm Carl LaBelle. I'm the Chief Development Officer at Frequency. Um, I'm trained as a pharmacologist, toxicologist, been in the industry, biotech industry primarily for about 30 years, I'm basically a drug developer. I've worked in a number of different therapeutic areas. Um, worked on, had the great fortune of working on a number of drugs that are approved that help a lot of people today. And um, hopefully we're working on another one now. Uh, and I've been in the ear for a little bit more than a decade now. So I'm uh, really pleased to, to be sharing this session with you, Brian. Great. Thanks. Kevin? Hi, Brian. I'm Kevin Frank. Um, my whole career has been in hearing, but I'm very new to pharmaceuticals. So in, in hearing, I've been involved on the clinical side, the academic side, and the corporate side, working in um, you know, various parts around the world. My most recent job was running audiology at Mass Ioneer, Harvard Medical School, and I started here at Frequency just about a year ago. And my job here at Frequency is to see that um, great ideas that start in the lab are able to translate into the clinic and work on the commercial side. Well, it's great to have both of you here. I'm excited to kind of dive into this topic. And I thought we could start with the big picture and talk because most of our viewers probably it's been a while since they've had a, a biology class or a biochemistry class. Uh, so I thought we could start by having you talk about uh, progenitor cells and just the, the, the basic concept of uh, regenerative medicine. Yeah, sure. I can start. Um, Kevin can, can jump in after. Um, so everything that we're going to talk about today, all of this essentially culminates in years of work in our labs all the clinical trials that we've done, all of that culminates now in a big trial that we're doing, what we call the 208 study. So hopefully we'll talk some more about that, but um, all that success and all the hard work by our team and, and all the patients and sites that we work with, um, it, that's what's gotten us here. So it's that partnership. Um, in terms of regenerative medicine, so the, the, the way that frequency got its start, really um, preceding that was work that was happening uh, in the labs of two professors, one at MIT, and uh, that's Bob Langer. The other one at Harvard is Jeff Karp. Those are our co-founders. And they have been interested in regenerative medicine. When people think about regenerative medicine, they tend to think about gene therapy, um, CRISPR, um, the kinds of things that where you're really altering the DNA, okay? And that's not what we're doing here. So in the early days, um, the two of them were studying the small intestine because that's one of the most regenerative tissues in the human body. Um, the lining of our small intestine tends to turn over about every four days or so. And they were struck by how regenerative that tissue could be. Yet there would be other tissues in the body, like the cochlea in, the, in mammals that doesn't turn over at all, okay? And so the question is, why is that the case? And in, in what they were able to identify were cells in the small intestine called LGR5 positive cells. This is a receptor that sits on the surface of some of these cells. And those, those cells in particular are what are called stem-like cells. They start from stem cells, but then they make their way to a point where they're pre-programmed. They, they're, they're, they're responsible for doing one thing in particular. And it turns out that those very same cells or cousins to those cells are present in the cochlea. Well, why do they turn over so quickly in the small intestine, but not in the cochlea? And the reason for that, we believe, is because the cells in the cochlea don't get the signals that the cells in the small intestine are getting. So the approach that we've taken is, well, let's figure out how we can provide that signal back. And we think when we've been able to do that by giving FX322, the two molecules that make up that drug candidate that we're working on, it is those two molecules that we believe activate those previously dormant progenitor cells in the cochlea. And um, hopefully, you know, the, the things that it does after that and um, the, the benefit it provides in the clinic, um, hopefully that continuum of biology 
to, to um, transitioning in the, to an effect in the clinic, um, we hope that that continues to bear out. So maybe Kevin, you could go into a little more detail about what's happening with these two drugs inside the cochlea. Sure. Um, you know, I was a graduate student in the late '90s at University of Washington, and there was a a primary research there, a researcher there who was very excited about the promises of hair cell regeneration. And so we learned all about what that may be one day, and it was always over the horizon. And throughout my clinical career, you know, particularly when I worked in cochlear implants, I'd have patients who'd say, is there something I can do besides have this thing permanently put into my head? And is there some shot I can get? And the answer was always maybe one day, but no. And what's exciting is we have a clinical trial happening right now. It's called our, our 208 clinical trial that we're recruiting subjects for that is that are getting these shots. And we've seen data that have shown a positive um, effect of this drug in, in previous studies. So, you know, to I just feel so lucky in my career to be at a place now where maybe, you know, we're at that point that we began to learn about when I was in graduate school way back before, uh, <laughs> before it became the year 2000, it seems like a, a million years ago. <laughs> I mean, what, what's happening in the cochlea is it's, you know, it's these progenitor cells that sit there, the supporting cells do what they did when we were, you know, in utero and, and they make hair cells and then they go back to sleep. And what we're doing is waking them up again and having to make hair cells again. It's, it's, you're, you're giving them a signal to do something that they did very well a long time ago. And, you know, I think we all appreciate the complexity of the inner ear and a lot of things need to be working together for you to get hearing, but, you know, getting hair cells to regenerate is a key piece and may lead to other downstream effects that, that cause us to be able to improve how well we hear and how well we perceive word. Well, I think um, I wanna ask you about some of the studies that you've done already, the one that was published uh, not too long ago, but I think maybe a question that a lot of our viewers would have is, uh, how does the drug get into the cochlea? Yeah, important question. Um, it's, a, it's a basic question when you're trying to develop drugs. Um, so you have to demonstrate that they get to where they need to go and that the right amount gets there. And so um, what, what we understand about how the process works is <clears throat> we've taken the two drugs, uh, they're essentially dissolved in a polymer. And that polymer with those two drugs is what um, is injected into the middle ear. So um, in our, all of our trials, um, an otolaryngologist or ENT um, does the injection with a fairly small gauge needle. Um, the, we put a little anesthetic on the eardrum and then the injection is made um, basically a, a, a fairly painless procedure uh, to administer. It takes maybe 10 seconds or so to inject the material. So it's pretty quick. It's done in an office based setting. So it's pretty convenient. <clears throat> so once the material is injected, um, the beauty of this polymer is it transitions from a liquid to a gel. And that trans transition to a gel is what gives us a little bit of resonance time. It gives the drug some resonance time in that middle ear. And the, the material now is setting up over what's called the round window membrane. That is almost like a screen door between the middle ear and the inner ear or the cochlea. And if that gel is sitting over the round window membrane, then the two small molecules that make up FX322 can diffuse through that membrane into the cochlea. And one of the things that we demonstrated in the otology neurotology paper uh, very clearly is both of those drugs are localized primarily in the highest frequency range, okay? Somewhere probably north of about 8,000 Hertz, right? And we think that's important because you know, we, we're, we know not in all cases, but we know that hearing, um, we tend to lose our hearing first in the highest frequency range. And there's a lot of really important information up in that range of frequencies that we think is, is all the critical clarity of, of, of sound and clarity of language and the ability to be able to understand more. That is, is, is what's the most important thing. It's the, we think that's the unmet medical need. So that diffusion process into the cochlea, activating those progenitor cells, as Kevin was describing. And then once those cells are awakened, they're dividing, hopefully they're generating new hair cells. And the, and the generation of those new hair cells, we think, 
is what's associated with this res restoration of speech perception or an improvement in speech perception. Well, let's talk about that next. Um, I was really struck by the data that was in the paper. Uh, and for our viewers, uh, it's uh, an open access paper, I believe. Uh, uh, neurotology, uh, otology, neurotology published maybe last August or September. Yep. And we'll put a link in the show notes so people can have access to that paper. But maybe, uh, Kevin, if you could talk a little bit about some of the findings. I mean, I was really struck by uh, a few of the subjects, how much improvement they had on word recognition scores, both in quiet and in noise. And the fact that you accounted for sort of the natural variability in word lists. So if you could talk about some of the data that you collected. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Um, so this one study, and there have been a number of single dose studies, but this is the first one that's published in Otology Neurotology, which you know, maybe your, your readers will be able to follow along as I describe. There's a figure in there, uh, figure number four, actually, which shows speech perception performance. And, and I'll describe uh, the speech perception performance that I think you're alluding to. So uh, the we looked at Maryland CNC words, a relatively standard CNC word test, and presented these, these word lists to people before they got the drug and people after they got the drug. We looked at various time points, but we are predominantly looking at around 90 days, three months, to see the greatest effect. And that's also short enough that if they went back into a noisy environment, perhaps, you know, they wouldn't have changed their hearing for the worse. And we see a range of baseline performances that go from, you know, 10% up to, you know, quite high, um, you know, 90% or so. But there are people in the middle of that range, you know, between, say, 20 and 60% on the graph who show remarkable improvements. And as, as you noted, you know, these improvements are more than what clinically you might think of as, 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 as a noticeable effect. You know, a 10% improvement we might believe is, oh yeah, a, a patient could notice that in their lives. But we also use Thornton Raffin, of course, to make sure that there was a bar that was um, consistent with how many words are presented. And of course, everything we present is recorded. And with 50 word lists, we, we have a lot of confidence that the, it's not test retest we're looking at, we're looking at a change. So yeah, I mean, I'm looking at a subject now on this graph who started around 20 and ended around 60. <laughs> That's remarkable. Yeah, and it's pretty remarkable. And it was 90 days after the drug was 90 done. days after the drug. And when you, you know, I've had patients who've experienced the type of benefit with other with a cochlear implant, and what they notice in their lives is unbelievable. You know, when you have that type of change, it's it's transformational. And and more than one subject had that degree of performance. And when we looked at later on studies, we also saw some other, um, some other studies that had similar um, results where people really showed that change from their baseline to, to where they are at, at 90 days. So when we were designing this next trial, this 208 trial, we learned from this published study, as well as all of our other um, studies to really design something where we can replicate that effect um, with enough placebo patients to really power the study to make more definitive statements about the efficacy of the drug. This study you're reading in 201 was a very important study, but it was a phase one study and some efficacy there too, but we were looking for safety. And of course, right. the speech perception is a safety score because if it got worse, that would have been a bad thing. Mm -hmm. When you see, the, the, so the test was really de not designed to make a definitive statement on efficacy, but it showed it quite well. So through all the planning, um, Carl's been doing, we, we now have a study underway that's going to look at a powered, in a powered way, where we can make real comparisons between a placebo control, double blind, of course, and the, the active FX322 group. Well, let's talk about that study, the second study that um, you're working on right now. What's the difference? I'm assuming it's just, it's a much higher N, a lot more per participants. Is there any uh, other key differences between the published study that you you've mentioned and the one that you're working on now, collecting data on? Yeah, a lot of important features. Um, so it is it is the sixth trial now that we have done. So we've, the last four years, you know, in the otology neurotology paper, that's the very first trial we did. We, we, we started that study back in 2018. And so now we've done five trials and it, it takes this long to get through, to learn about your drug, to make sure you understand that it's safe um, and you have to keep doing that. So the, the 208 study that is running now, 
Um, it is, as I said at the beginning, it really is, it's the culmination of four years and five trials and all of the biology work that we did that preceded that. Um, so when we talk through design components, it's firstly, what is the population of, of subjects that we're going to be studying? And what we have learned is that if subjects he either have a medical history that's associated with either noise exposure or if they have a sudden sensory neural loss, but that hearing, that loss has to be permanent, okay? So those are the two groups of patients that we're looking at. And then remember hearing is sort of comes in all different severity levels. And so the range of severity that we're generally testing is from the moderate to roughly the low to mid severe range. Okay, those sort of three categories. So two etiologies across three categories of severity. And that's the group that we are currently recruiting. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that we have learned over the years is it's really important to establish a really stable baseline measure. And the way that we go about that in the current trial is once patients qualify, they go into what we call a lead-in period. And that lead-in period doesn't have any drug intervention whatsoever. It's simply our patients coming in every two weeks and they do that three times and they establish a single average baseline value on all of the tests that we perform, but we get that value by averaging across three different visits, okay? And that way we can know that patients are stable in, in, their, in their condition. Then at that point, uh, it's determined if, if, their, if their criteria, if the uh, values of their test sessions meet the criteria, then they can get what we call randomized to the trial. And in this case, they're either randomized to receiving one injection of FX322 in one ear or an injection of placebo, okay? The number of subjects that are going to get randomized to the trial, the goal is to randomize 124 subjects. So it'll be the largest trial that we've ever done. And we think probably one of the larger trials ever done in the hearing loss space. So once they've been randomized and they receive the treatment, um, throughout this study, there's about at least six to seven visits that they come in roughly every month. Um, we're, we're doing a number of different tests on them. We're testing speech perception in both quiet uh, speech perception in a noisy background. Um, we're doing, and, and we do multiple tests um, to understand that. We do all of the pure tone thresholds. We do the standard frequency range. We do the extended high frequency range, and there's lots of other measures. So it's a really thorough measure of now being able to show efficacy by showing improvements in speech perception, and then also making sure that we can continue to demonstrate a good safety profile. The other thing, probably the most important thing, is the measure of speech perception is, is what patients have told us is the most important thing to them. Now, this came about out of a session that was run by the Hearing Loss Association of America, um, also with FDA. So this was a patient-focused drug development um, uh, event sponsored by FDA and others. And um, in that event, it, it was patients that said, look, we can hear sound, we just can't understand it. And if, if, if there'd be a way for us to better understand, well, that would be remarkable. And so that output from that meeting and our design of the trial line up right on what is the most important endpoint. And again, speech perception. So we will be testing for speech perception in this trial um, once 124 subjects have completed their 90th day of the study. And once that happens, we'll do the analysis, we'll all get unblinded, and uh, we're, we're really hopeful that we're able to show a statistically significant effect here. I guess the obvious question then is when can, um, when can we expect to see that publication? Well, we'll we will we said uh, last week we disclosed at an at a investor meeting that we would be uh, seeing the results and sharing the results either in the fourth quarter of this year, so towards the end of this year, or in the first quarter of 2023. We don't know exactly when the results will become available because we're recruiting patients to to get into the study, 
And all of us in the you know, pharmaceutical development space, we're all running clinical trials in the face of a pandemic. And so we have to be mindful of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, we got to make sure that our patients are safe and our, our, our sites are safe and they're following the, you know, the policies that they, that they need to according to their local jurisdictions. Um, it's just a reality that we have to deal with, but we're, we're working as hard as we can. That's good to know. Uh, Kevin, you're an audiologist, and um, I'm curious to know your take on where these sort of treatments fit into the broader picture of uh, of clinical audiology. You know, yeah. If you had a crystal ball f- three, five years down the road, um, how do you see uh, your uh, pharma- pharmacological treatment fitting into the clinical picture? So let's let's make some assumptions to to have that crystal ball. So if we assume, mm-hmm. you know, where our current data is now, that we're able to improve speech perception, but not improve audibility. So that's kind of our audiograms didn't shift, but our speech perception did. So you know, when I think about what, what Carl said with the P, with the patients who went to the PFDD said is, we want clarity. We want to be able to understand better, particularly in noise. And I think many patients felt that audibility had been well captured through devices, but speech perception clarity, speech clarity was still a a missing feature. And so I would imagine, and and we all know that some of our patients struggle more with clarity than other people, right? If you're amplifying someone who has a conductive hearing loss, they can hear very clearly. But if you're amplifying someone who has a, a severe hearing loss with a lot of distortion in what they hear, they really struggle. And I would love, you know, in, in the future that a, a clinician can say, we have a variety of things that can help you. And many of these things may work together. So if, if amplification is something you need, we've got, you know, a variety of amplification devices. Um, and on top of that, you can have clarity provided for, you know, with additional intervention. So you've got audiologists working with ENTs that can both provide benefits to patients together and with each other, right? So the, the physician has a reason to reach out to the audiologist because clarity without audibility is, is, is unusable. And um, the audiologist can reach out to the physician saying, I've got some patients that are still struggling to really understand and can work together. So, I mean, I really see a, a very um, a good referral relationship that allows physicians to finally be able to treat sensory neural hearing loss beyond devices and for audiologists to be able to help patients get beyond that um, understanding issue that many of them have. And, you know, the shot is, is similar to what um, ENTs do now with steroid um, injections if someone experiences a sudden hearing loss. So it's, it's something they know how to do very well and something that many audiologists have counseled patients through already saying, yes, you've had a severe hearing loss, but since you're here right after it happened, um, you know, the physician be able to give you this injection and, and they come back and say, oh, that wasn't so bad. Um, you know, as we really get going, you can only imagine big audiology practices that have a physician come visit, you know, a day a week to do a series of injections. So it's, it doesn't entirely mean that it all happens at the physician's office, you know, to do an injection. Yes, you need to have, you know, someone lie down, you need to have a, a proper scope, but you really can envision different ways of assembling care to get at where the patients want to be seen. Yeah, that, that's, I think if that's you, exciting. And if you give me a moment, I just want to brag a little bit about the, the trial Carl designed. One of the Please. things he put in there was some audiologic monitoring where we have a microphone on the patient and we have a video camera on the audiometer and we're able to review the visits. And the things that our monitor, this is an independent monitor has found are the types of things that I could have easily made a mistake on in my clinical career. And uh, notably, you know, when a patient repeats a word back, the, uh, the audiologist often has a headset on like I have now, you know, one ear for the audiometer, the other ear listening to the patient through sometimes, a, you know, a, a mixture of who's what. And once in a while, the, the remote audiologist hears a different word than the audiologist did. And the remote audiologist gets to use, you know, noise canceling, nice headphones and plays it back to the audiologist at the site who often is like, oh, yeah, that was the word. <laughs> and, and even in ensuring that the, the instruction is similar, because we want our patients to guess. And some people are a little cautious about guessing. So we can even ensure that the instructions are consistent through these recordings. And that's a level of 
you know, when we first described it, it's like, is it going to feel like Big Brother? I think it feels like, um, you know, the type of, of insight we got when we were graduate students, you know, to really hone our practice. So it's, it's a really great ability to make sure everything is consistent across all of our trial sites and that those really core measures are, are done just to the top of our clinical practice. No doubt. I, I, uh, you know, I, I hate to admit it, but I think that there's a lot of uh, practitioners out there that don't use recorded words and use a half list. And um, so it's kind of a lesson for them that how important it is to be precise yeah. in your testing. Yeah, not in these trials. And so no, it's, it is It is great, but not only that, but the way you instruct the test and, and how right, you exactly. listen to the test, it's really it's well It's all done. really important that it's done right. Um, I wanted to go back to something that you mentioned, because I think it's a really important point that we unpack for our viewers. And that is in your trials, you've seen an improvement in word recognition scores, but you haven't seen necessarily an improvement in audibility. Now, uh, to me, that's a really interesting finding. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that? Kevin, you want to take that? Sure. So, of course, when we started, well, we I wasn't working in the company at the time, but we were looking for effects on everything, right? We wanted to see where there would be effects. And so when we saw speech perception and didn't see audibility, it you know, made you scratch your head and say, well, why could that be? And, you know, we've got really bright scientists and, and biologists who, who and, and we've all learned enough about the auditory system that there's a story there that kind of makes sense. And, you know, the, the parts of the auditory system that deal with detection are often different parts of the auditory system that deal with super threshold types of activities. And, um, you know, these speech perception tests are presented, you know, well into people's sensation level so that they can, we don't have to deal with things that are right near audibility. And um, so, yeah, you know, it, we were looking for effects of, we want to see effects in our PROs and our thresholds and our speech perception and everything, but we did not see it in the, the uh, thresholds. Um, but it, like I said, that that's okay. You know, as long as right. we're getting at clarity, as long as we're getting at improving the person's ability to, to get on with life. And uh, so it's, you know, that's, you just follow the science and this is what the science told us and did so in multiple trials and where we've seen the signal, not just in this one that's been published, but the others that we have, that we've presented on and are contained in our, you know, the information that's at our website. So, hey, when you see the same answer multiple times, you you believe it and you, and you just keep moving forward. You follow the science as they yep. say, yeah. Uh... Well, I see that we've been, uh, I want to maybe wrap things up now. Any, uh, any final thoughts, any other additional comments you want to share with our viewers around your clinical trials, around the concept of regenerative medicine? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll start and just, um, again, I, it's kind of where I started today with you. Um, th this study that we've got running, it, it has taken learnings over the last several years and multiple clinical trials. And, and we think has ended up into a really well-designed study that um, we think is, is really now gonna set the standard for future trials in this space. And the elements that we discussed earlier about doing multiple um, baseline measures in order to make sure that the subject is starting from a really um, consistent place. If we get that consistency at the start of the study, it increases the likelihood of being able to observe a change, right? Or being able to accurately measure that change. Um, and we want to be able to do that because we really want to be certain at this point that what we're now seeing, we can call efficacy. We want to move away from what we've been talking about as a signal, a, a, an auditory improvement signal to something that we can say that the drug is efficacious. And this study is powered and has enough um, patients in it for us to be able to, what we think now, detect that difference. So for us, it's all coming down now to, to this study. And again, we have to thank our sites, the staff at our sites, and we have to thank the patient volunteers that are willing to um, sign up for it because they, they appreciate that they may get assigned to the placebo group. And, and, and look, we're, we're, we're going to take care of those patients down the road, right? But um, uh, we're, we're excited about the progress we're making. We're looking forward to the results one day and the timing that we talked about. And uh, again, thank you to everyone that's helped make this, uh, this, this study happen. And, and I'll just add that I feel thankful and lucky you know, to be 
you know, there's a lot that's happening in our field right now. And what an exciting time to be in mm -hmm. he hearing healthcare. And it's been exciting for, you know, a little while, but this is a whole new dimension. And, um, you know, it takes a lot of courage for a company to, to try to make a difference like this. And, and all those people that it takes for that to happen is, as Carl said, just so grateful for the clinicians that stick on these long protocols, the the subjects who come in and do that over and over mm -hmm. again, the monitors who imagine how many videos you watch of just <laughs> audiometer setting. It just takes so many people for this to work. And, and uh, everyone who's interested in spreading the word like you are, um, we all hope to help people hear better. And uh, we really think this is going to be a way to do it. Yeah, no, it's distant. exciting. Sure. Tremendous amount of dedication on a lot of people's parts. Uh, and it's not like early on, I share your sentiment about, um, you know, sitting in class 30 years ago, talking about some of these things, that's kind of a pipe dream. And now it's uh, really close, seems like to reality. So um, um, hopefully in six months or so after your trial has been published, uh, we can have you back on and we can talk maybe a little bit about candidacy and some other things that uh, clinicians might want to know about based on some of your findings. So uh, Carl LaBelle, Kevin Frank, can't thank you enough for your time and your expertise. Thanks for being with us on This Week in Hearing. Well, thanks to you, Brian. We appreciate it.